Several years ago, I saw a multi-million dollar SaaS acquisition not go through because of the level of technical debt that the application had. Now, acquisitions getting canceled because of technical issues are rare, but frankly, any amount of technical debt that you're carrying with you over the years or decades you run your business, it's gonna be a competitive disadvantage. It's an anti-pattern. And while every app has some level of technical debt, if you let it stack up over time, it's gonna slow down your feature velocity, make it hard to retain developers because they don't wanna work on crappy code. And yes, it's feasible that it could even impact your ability to get acquired. So in today's video, I'm gonna talk about seven ways to get ahead of technical debt and keep it under control. I'm Rob Walling. I've started six companies, five of them bootstrapped. I've written four books on entrepreneurship and I've invested in more than 125 startups. Today, I enlist the help of my friend, Derek Reimer. He's the founder of SavvyCal, and he's written tens of thousands of lines of code in his life that have processed literally billions upon billions of records, database records, emails sent, all kinds of things, as he was a co-founder and senior developer on Drip, as well as his other engineering efforts. So for our first point, let's have Derek kick us off. So my first piece of advice for avoiding technical debt in your code base is to write automated tests. And there's a couple of reasons for doing this. The first is that it helps you verify that the code that you just wrote does what you actually expected it to do and continues to do that over time as you modify the code base and update dependencies and so on. But there's a secondary benefit also, and it's that practicing test-driven development actually helps you write more maintainable code, right? So if you write your test first and then write code to satisfy those expectations, you're going to inherently produce code that has better separation of concerns, is more focused and, and narrow in on, on the task at hand, and you're just going to inherently produce code that you can extend easier over time and other people can reason about easier. And so for those reasons, don't skip writing the tests. Approach number two is something that I debated whether I should say it or not, because frankly, I would hope that if you're writing production code these days, this is an absolute no brainer and it's to use source control. When I think back, even 15 years, there were a lot of developers that I worked with where if they weren't working on a team that required it, they wouldn't use source control. Now source control used to be more cumbersome, used to be more expensive, used to be more of a pain to use. And frankly, these days, the options for amazing source control packages like Git, where you can use them on GitHub, which you can consume for, I think I pay $7 a month for my GitHub account. There's also GitLab, there's Bitbucket, there's all kinds of places you can go online to get source control. And source control frees you up to make bold changes. I remember 20 years ago coding without source control and we would comment out big pieces of the code because in case we needed to go back, you know, we didn't have a history, it was, it was scary. And that risk is a lot like not having unit tests where you cannot make bold changes and so your code gets crufty. So I don't wanna belabor this point because my hope is that if you're watching this video, you're already using source control, but if you're not, you need to get on that right away. Now back to Derek for point number three. My next piece of advice is to aggressively adopt auto formatters, linters, static analysis tools, really anything available in your developer ecosystem that can automatically look after code quality issues for you. I recommend installing these whenever possible into your local development environment um, so that when you save a file, any checks that can automatically run and correct themselves will just do so on save. And then anything that does require developer intervention will hopefully show a little blue underline so the developer can address it right there before committing the code. I also recommend installing this in your continuous integration service so that any little issues that might have slipped past the developer get caught before you merge the branch into production. But in general, anything that you can automate to help improve code quality is a win and I recommend it. Point number four for staying ahead of technical debt is to slow down. It's from the start to prioritize code quality, to invest in proper coding practices, design patterns, and you know, debatable, maybe some documentation so you can ensure a solid foundation for your application. The mistake I see, especially non-technical founders make, is they'll push developers to ship quickly at the sacrifice of code quality, at the sacrifice of unit tests, at the sacrifice of all the things that we're talking about in this video. And in the short term, that can make you ship a bit quicker. Maybe you ship five or 10% quicker. But in the long term, and by long term, I mean by the time you hit 5,000, 10,000 lines of code, this might be six, 12 months in, you start to grind, you start to slow down. You start to introduce regression bugs that don't really make sense because you don't have that unit test coverage and you have dependencies that you've never undone. 
So one way to avoid that is to give your developers enough space to write high quality code and to not take shortcuts, make quick fixes that lead to technical debt. Because cleaning up technical debt is one thing, but if you can help not introduce it in the first place or at least introduce less of it, you'll be in a better position. My next piece of advice is to regularly budget time for housekeeping. The truth is there's no such thing as perfect code, and especially if you're moving fast, trying to deliver value to customers quickly, you're gonna end up making trade-offs in the moment in the name of velocity. And I think that's okay. I think it's healthy to adopt a better done than perfect mindset. But if you know you're making a decently sized trade-off that you would like to address at some point in the future, maybe you duplicated some code and you wanna refactor that, but it's not worth doing in the moment, we like to file tickets for that um, in a bucket we call housekeeping. And on a regular basis, my team and I will go through that bucket and make sure that it's not getting too large and that we don't have too many things stacking up that are affecting our code quality. We generally spend a little bit of time on Fridays working on tickets from this bucket and also in between bigger initiatives, we'll pull tickets out of there and just kind of make sure that, that our debt load is not getting too high. I like to think of this as carrying a debt load and making sure that we're not headed towards technical bankruptcy. Tactic number six for staying ahead of technical debt is to require code reviews such that anyone who commits code to production has to be reviewed by at least one other member of the team, usually someone that's more senior than them, but frankly, that doesn't always have to be the case. Something that I've learned, no matter how senior you are, you can always have blind spots. You can always make mistakes. You can sometimes take shortcuts and maybe not realize it, or maybe you do. And having someone else, even if they're a mid-level developer, call you on it is a helpful way to keep the quality of your code base up. If you're a solo developer, single founder, obviously there's no one to review your code. And in the early days, you are gonna have to commit some code to the repo without anyone else around. But the moment you have a collaborator, again, whether they are more senior or less senior than you, it's a good idea for you to review their code and them to review yours. And it's for things like consistency, regressions, unit tests. I mean, that's a big one, right? We sometimes skimp on our unit tests and having someone else call us out on it can be helpful. I'm not much of a process person. I tend to like to move fast and not bog things down. But even on my development teams, we've always required code reviews to keep the quality of that code base high. My final piece of advice is to avoid procrastinating on version updates for your dependencies. If you're like me, you have a love-hate relationship with dependencies. Obviously you need them because you don't wanna reinvent the wheel every time you need to do something in your application. But the drawback is they change over time, right? People discover security vulnerabilities or maintainers decide to add new features and they release new versions. And anytime you adopt those versions, there's potential for something to unforeseen to break in your application, which is a bummer. Hopefully you have a robust test suite to catch any edge cases that may crop up and hopefully you have error monitoring in place in production to look out for random exceptions. But in general, it's best to just tackle it head on when a new version is released, treat it as a housekeeping task and keep tabs regularly on your key dependencies as they change over time and just roll up your sleeves and get down to it because it only gets more painful the longer you wait. Thanks again to Derek for joining me this week. You can follow him on Twitter at Derek Reimer. In a minute, I'm gonna tell you the next video you should watch if you feel like you got value from this one. But before I dive into that, Mastermind Matching is opening the week that this video goes live. At MicroConf, we have matched close to a thousand founders across a kajillion time zones, more than 150, approaching 200 million in collective ARR. MicroConf.com slash masterminds if you wanna check that out. Applications open May 3rd, they close on May 12th, and matches will be sent by May 17th. If you feel like you're stuck on your journey or like you're doing it alone and you wanna be matched up with a handful of other ambitious bootstrapped SaaS founders who get where you're at and can walk alongside you on this journey, head to microconf.com slash masterminds. If you like this video, you're probably always on the lookout for tools that can help you be a better developer. Check out this video where I cover eight developer tools you're probably not using yet. Thanks for watching.